आई वी एम Hello and welcome to the first episode of Voices for Water. My first guest on the show is Mridula Ramesh, founder of the Sundaram Climate Institute which focuses on waste, water solutions and education. Mridula is also an active angel investor in clean tech with a portfolio of over a dozen startups. She is a graduate from Cornell and an MBA from the Kellogg School of Management and worked at McKinsey in the Silicon Valley before returning to India. She lives in Madurai and teaches a postgraduate class on climate change at the Great Lakes Institute of Management. She has written extensively for the Hindu and Down to Earth on water and earlier this year she published a new book Watershed How we destroyed India's water and how we can save it. A book that is in equal parts both scary and hopeful. Scary because she breaks down the generational and systemic errors we made as a society and how clear and present the dangers around our water security are hopeful because the majority of the book is about solutions that are real i spoke to mridula about india's great water challenge and how our relationship with water has evolved over the ages i also asked her about the reasons that has led us to where we are today and what gives her hope what can we do individually and as a society to ensure things don't get worse than they are mridula welcome to the show and uh, congratulations on this extremely important book there is so much uh, to talk about here but i wanted to start off by asking you if you can break down for us what is india's great water challenge uh no thank you thank you karthik for doing this and thank you uh, india water portal for doing this also i think it's uh, it's great that we're having this show on water because you know we talk, everybody understands the climate challenge right everybody gets it but everybody in speaking about climate talks about you know the need to cut carbon emissions and that's critical but what is less understood is the climate itself speaks through water the rising incidence of floods the paradoxically rising incidence of droughts the sea level rise glaciers melting all of it is speaking through water and india as one of the most vulnerable countries to climate change needs to get this and india's great water challenge is really a challenge of not understanding its own water well enough right uh, india's water is very different from the world's water you're saying no water is water you drink it in a cup and that's it but india's water has certain facets about it right and it it comes from the fact that India draws so much of its water from the monsoon and therefore shares its characteristics. It's very geographically variable. So there are places that get, you know, less than 200 mm of rain a year and then there are places that get meters of rainfall a year. You know, there are places uh India has very few rain days compared to many other parts of the world. It has one of the most seasonal rains in you know the water availability is more seasonal than most other countries in the world it varies across years uh, we don't understand that well enough as we should today uh, we've forgotten about it and we'll get to that the second part of the great water challenge is we don't value it we're like in a totally dysfunctional relationship with water right we neither it's like in a relationship if you don't understand the other person and you don't value the other person how functional is your relationship and you know we see all these different crises like floods and drought and day zero and you know the smog in delhi we see these as unrelated crises that keep cropping up they're not they all share and that's what i've tried to do in my book they all share a common seed which is this lack of understanding and not valuing it so in tamil there is a saying that says koranga kaila poomala kurta enna which means if you give a monkey a garland what will happen like a flower garland it neither understands it nor does it value it so the garland gets split apart that's what we do that's our challenge to value right. that garland beautifully put and i think in in the book you you spend a lot of time talking about what you just said which is our our relationship with water and uh, the entire volatility of water in india and i think uh, if i'm not wrong you mentioned that we probably only get about 100 hours of rainfall um in a year no we Did get most we get 
this actually challenge you know it was shocking to me when i heard it and i heard it from a director of uh, the national institute of hydrology and he said you know we get most of our rain in 100 100 hours and if you go and you look at the number of rain days in each city it's far fewer and there's a graph i have in the book that says you know look at the world cities and look at the number of rain days that is the days on which it rains in india and we really fall you know in the in a very skewed fashion at one end of the graph where we just receive our rain in a very concentrated fashion so if we got like you know 800 mm of rain you know say in 120 days and we got little little bit every year you won't need to store it as much but if you get 800 mm of rain in 40 days you'll need to store it and you know protect it in some way because we use water every day right so it's a very skewed rainfall compared to many other parts of the world especially europe but the problem is the europe uh, the people who came from europe said you know our water is like their water and they put technologies that work there on us and it didn't work but we are skipping ahead yeah to help understand this at a very basic level right to mm-hmm. help understand mm-hmm. the threat right so mm-hmm. let me ask you a question which might sound like i'm coming from a from a fairly layman's perspective mm-hmm. but if you have to break it down for the uninitiated are we mm-hmm. running out of water is is that the actual threat uh because most of us feel that water is as renewable as any other source of substance right and um you know if 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 i find wasting too much water bathing i know that it's, it's it's i'm i'm thinking that it's probably evaporating and coming back to me as rain right so is the real threat of us running out of water okay that's a great question right so water is not oil so sh- we shouldn't run out that's the thinking right well let's look at it this way there are parts of india that have run out already right they don't have piped water and they've exhausted their groundwater and i know this because just this week i've invested in a startup that you know treats uh, sewage to sell to those people so it's there are enough of them and they're willing to pay so there is actually a startup catering to their needs and they think their you know market is going to grow only grow and grow well but i think what might help is actually to use a financial analogy right so let's take this person call him x and say x earns uh, 10000 rupees a month right so that is his renewable water coming in right and x has some savings so 10000 rupees is not a lot but he's got some savings say he's got uh, 20000 rupees savings but x has children who need to go to school x has uh, you know uh, Uh, let's say x also gets 10000 rupees not every month but he gets t- like 40000 rupees and then you know like a trickle for the rest of the year like our rainfall now his expenses are every month but his expenses are 15000 rupees right so there's that 5000 rupees which he's drawing from savings so this is precisely what is happening in many parts of india there is a section of rainfall and water which is renewable right so the water you store right the water you store under your ground is renewable but we are all so many of us are overdrawing that water not just 100% but 200 300% and like take punjab for instance right there are plots of punjab that are overdrawing its renewable ground water two to three times it's happening in hyderabad it's happening in bengaluru it's happening in chennai it's happening in madurai it's happening all over we are overdrawing what is renewable sure if we lived within that 10000 rupees is renewable it's it's you know we have enough storage it's fine but the, when you start overdrawing some of that groundwater has been saved over millennia right and we've exhausted that and that's not going to be replenished that quickly i hope that answers the question to some extent it does it does in fact it's it's it's, it's chilling when you put it that way right like because then i'm i'm looking at cities like Uh, a bangalore for example which mm-hmm. probably has run out of water many many decades back and we are overdrawing every minute every every uh, every second right yeah and, But, and in chennai for in sorry uh, just to push it in coastal areas when you overdraw water what happens right so you have like this groundwater area which which has fresh water which is not salty but you're sitting next to a sea and when you start drawing out all your groundwater the salt water begins to intrude into your groundwater aquifers so even if you start putting you know fresh water in it's now salty so 
it's, it's very, and you're very concretizing the surfaces so yeah. you have less money going in so it's when you concrete the surface to just go on the financial analogy which i've used in the book it's like your internet connection is down when you want to draw money from your internet back because once you concrete your water can't even enter to go and get stored so it's not renewable anymore scary you know as as you're talking about this i'm thinking of the many indias within india right and i feel we should probably talk about water security because you know today your your access to water uh, is not only determined by what is on ground like we just spoke but also about uh, uh, you know economics of 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 how much you earn or where you live or in some cases even who you are right in terms of uh, caste and everything else right but sticking to the core problem um, how many indians or rather what is the percentage of india that continues to have weak water security so again you know how do you define water security we'll step back for a moment and take that like, again let's go to a financial analogy right how do you determine if you're financially secure like uh, in finance you'll say are you saving enough for a rainy day to flip that to water it's do you have enough for a dry day right and uh, the fact of the matter is you know the the sad part and why this this problem remains hidden is we don't have very good data and it's not a recent problem we've at least recently the one good development is this wris portal which is like a whole bunch of government departments that got there and said we'll put this water uh, data up in somewhat of an accessible fashion so it's a good development but we never had very good granular data so one thing um uh, the institute i set up uh, sundram climate institute data is we said we'll go and find out and we spoke to uh, you know i've talked to uh, 2000 households in the book but now it's well over that and we asked we studied their water realities and if you do 2000 households in a single city you get a very granular a uh, picture of how how many people who is water secure right and the point that you mentioned it matters who you are right and it's got an economic angle and uh, you know there are people who have thousand you know they have as much water as they want and they have plentiful ground waters and they're wealthy enough that they could uh, transport water if they want so they're perfectly water secure but if you look at a large number of people they're not they get water once in two days some of them have exhausted their groundwater they're not wealthy so they can't afford to buy tanker water and that's pitiful right there is a, there's a large part that don't have enough water like the who says you know you need an absolute minimum of about 70 liters a day if you want to live 30 li- uh, liters for drinking cooking you know then another 20 liters for cleaning vessels cleaning your house keeping yourself clean clothes clean and then another 10 20 liters if you want to have the luxury of getting rid of your waste in a hygienic manner right that's 70 liters is the absolute minimum but there is a sizable proportion of the people we spoke to that live on less than 50 liters of water per day per person and that number goes down in the summer remember the seasonality of india's water so on paper it may look that many cities are meeting their water demand but when you look at seasonality you know the when summer the pre summer months roll around the tankers start coming out for their kill which is what i've mentioned right again in the drier cities because we get our water from the monsoon uh during it's subject to global influences like the el nino so during el nino years our security goes down but again you know the, uh moving away from the financial analogy flip the coin are we secure from the ravages of water are we secure from floods are we secure from you know sea level rise and that's not entirely clear either at least many of us aren't and uh, uh you know and that's problematic you know you mentioned seasonality and um, this is a question that i know is in the minds of of most people right um you know every year we see newspaper reports on what was the india monsoon um like and whether it was you know on acceptable levels on par or below par etc what is the role of monsoon in this and for example if we were to have a very good monsoon uh, for the next 5 to 6 years by very good monsoon i mean excess of rain for the next 5 to 6 years can we turn back the clock on the problem i'm so glad you asked that question because the role of the monsoon is central to india's water right and why i start the book Uh, with a chapter called Meghaduta in the Machine Age, right? 
right? Our monsoon was called Meghadoota, the cloud messenger, beautifully put. And the sad part is we got it, right? And all of India's water comes from the monsoon. Either the past monsoon which is stored as ice, snow, you know, percolates into the ground, uh, or present monsoon. And what happens in the present monsoon is it rains. and uh, you know some of the heavier rain parts are forested and forests take that rain trap it slow it filter it and release the water periodically over time as streams which then join and give us our mighty rivers so you know this kalidasa being a poet captures all of this in one opening stanza of his meghadoota right and once you understand the monsoon and that's why the first chapter is about the monsoon you understand why it's seasonal right because uh, that's how you know it's the monsoon is literally the reflection of how the earth responds to the sun's gaze and that's why it's seasonal because you know the way the sun moves forward and backward uh, or appears to move forward and backward uh, that's that gives us the season and that's what gives us the monsoon and because it's a global phenomenon it's not a local land sea breeze as so many of us thought it was it's a global phenomenon dependent on the sun it is subject to other global phenomenon like the el nino the la nina the indian ocean dipole you know literally how the oceans and the air you know transmit heat and energy over time and space and so it varies across the years and depending on where you're located between mountain forest and sea your share of the monsoon varies as well so if you are unfortunately located like in the northwest of india not going to get that much rain right if you're fortunately or too fortunately located like the northeast of india you get meters of rainfall in a matter of months right and then if you're sitting in madras you get pretty much all your rainfall when the retreating monsoon sort of gives you your rain in the winter right if you are a madurai you get a bit of everything right you get some from the retreating monsoon you get some from the vaigai and so you know it's the monsoon is central once you understand like hey you're getting all your water from the monsoon and the monsoon has these facets and these are the facets of india's water you've really understood it now the second part of your question can a good monsoon help us turn it back well it could have we we understood it and we kept our forests intact because if you have your forests intact a good monsoon would get trapped stored released slowly a good monsoon could have helped if you kept your storage intact so the aries and the kanmais and you know all the talabs and the lakes those are storages that our ancestors built because they understood this that you know man, the monsoon varies over years it comes only once a year so let's store as much of it as we can but i live in choki kulam kulam means a uh, pond there is no kulam here it is gone it has been replaced by buildings right and so once you do that where are you going to store your seasonal you know cloud messengers uh, bounty you have nowhere to store it so once upon a time a good monsoon can help because a large part of our um farmers and agriculture is the biggest user of india's water a large part of our farmers are rain fed so a good monsoon which is predictable you know which has it doesn't have a whole bunch of breaks in between it, it can help but because we have damaged so many of our coping mechanisms right like forests and tanks and all of those it can't help as much as it could have that's tragic isn't it you know I, i loved how you started the answer by saying you know it, it's earth's uh, response to the gaze of the sun that's that's as poetic as it is scientific isn't it um but you can actually yeah. see it karthik mm. if you look mm. at a satellite image you can see this band of clouds right it's like really the blush of the earth you can see it girding across the planet and uh, the band of clouds moves it's called the intertropical convergence zone you know where the winds come and uh in the place of highest heating and uh it is you can see it it is the earth blushing as the sun's gaze hits the planet wow and i'm also taken by how many times you mentioned ancient civilizations forefathers in in the previous answer uh, and and you write you know eloquently in the book about uh, how their understanding of crops and water was um was was, was very very superior you know it 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 brings me to question where did we go wrong 
and like for example you spoke about madurai um the city i grew up in um, which is chennai um airy you know for the uninitiated means lakes and uh, the irony is that most of the high priced real estate today um in in chennai is places that end with airy like velacheri and 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 everything else <laughs> which is all been lakes at one point in time and t nagar was this giant lake where the chennai boat club held their annual regatta yeah yeah man i i studied in, in, in the loyola college which was a lake uh, many decades <laughs> back itself um where did we go wrong and is this is rapid urbanization was that a huge part of this problem okay how much do you attribute to that okay um so i think we went wrong in two ways right uh one point we stopped understanding the nature of india's water right if we understood that it was hey it's geographically varied it's seasonal it's temporal varies across years that's one part of the understanding and we lost that some point along the way and the second part is we stopped valuing india's water so in the beginning i said what is india's challenge these are the two and we lost these two links and the two links happened in different times the first break this forgetting the nature of india's water actually came with the british right so i speak about punjab and i actually look at you know if you start with the indus valley they uh, you know there is a study i quote in the book which looked at how the crop patterns changed in the indus valley over 1000 years right they lo- literally looked took up hundreds of seeds dated them across the different sites over time and said what did farmers grow and how did it change and it showed that farmers really grew crops that were in keeping with local water the big break the huge break came with the british you know who said you know the nature of india's water really doesn't matter because the british were foreshadowed by this guy called francois bernier and i've talked about him in the book he said look you know what there's so much wealth in india and he's a 17th century frenchman and he said there's so much wealth in india but it could be made so much more with superior european input and management and they said you know what let's the, he said the land's not irrigated at all didn't understand the ta- value of tank irrigation and so the british came in and said you know what all these forests don't matter let's clear the forests it creates new land to grow crops let's create these water engineering that can which didn't work with the fa- i have nothing against technology I just think you know go back to that Koranga Kaila Poomala when your human ingenuity works when you understand what you're trying to solve and the system you're trying to work it on if you don't understand it it really goes back to monkey garland uh, analogy and the engineering that came in didn't quite work with the facets right and they said you know it doesn't really matter uh we'll put a fixed cash tax and we'll make it lower than what you were paying earlier uh earlier people paid and that comes to value india's water has never been free right people always paid a price for it but the price was paid in kind or in labor so the moment you pay in kind your interannual variability is taken out because when you have a drought you'll have less crop so you pay less if you if you had a good year you paid more right that was automatically taken out but if you put a fixed cash tax that no longer works because now you come a drought it's fixed and you have to pay cash so you know you have to borrow to pay the second part of the pricing uh, will come to value later but the by destroying forests and saying fixed cash tax they made farmers grow crops not what was dictated by the local water availability farmers grew what would sell for cash which was wheat sugar cane you know rice in some parts and local water availability didn't matter because the canals were bringing water in for some of the fortunate farmers and no longer did the local market matter because the railways were carting it out so the british really said look you guys you know you were uh, it was very kachcha you know the word kachcha came in there it's not very sophisticated we will bring in superior technology and your local water availability doesn't matter and that change of crop pattern that started then because of this cash tax and this dramatic change of technology meant we are paying the price to this day we grow a crop that needs 1240 mm of rain in a place that gets between 400 to 600 mm of rain that's rice and that's the northwest of india and we make do by drawing on groundwater right so i think that mental change 
you know, where we forgot the nature of India's water, I would argue came really with the British. But then there's the second part, which is the valuing of India's water, right? So if you take Chanakya, who I talk about in the book, his water taxes are brilliant. Again, in kind, it's also progressive. You remember in the beginning, you said it matters who you are when you get water access. Chanakya's water rates were progressive. So if you're a poor farmer who manually lifted water from an irrigation source, you paid less tax, you paid a lower share of your crops than if you're a wealthy farmer who carted water away using bullock carts or other more forms of technology. It was never free. And that second part of not valuing India's water and instead portraying it as something that is free really came post-independence. And I think it came with democratic exigencies where uh, you know, new leaders just said, you know, this is something we'll give to you free. And um, that's problematic because how can you work with something if you neither understand it, not value it? And that's the bedrock of every crisis that looks different. You know, the floods look different from the crops, look different from the winter pollution in North India, but they all share this common seed, which is you, if you don't understand it and you don't value it, how are you going to manage it? Is unplanned urbanization a part of the, you know, uh, does it contribute to the crisis? Again, it goes back to a lack of understanding, right? So in Chennai, in Madurai, in Bangalore, in Bombay, Bombay once, I was surprised you know, I was to find out that it had 3,000 tanks and wells, you know, in the early part of the 19th century. Today, many of them are gone. They, you know, they become places which are prone to flooding. And again, you know, with the British, they said, we'll give you piped water. And all these tanks, uh, I was actually reading, you know, the health inspector report from 1916 in Chennai. And he says, you know, these are all places which are uh, unhealthy, you know, they're breeding grounds for cholera and malaria. And, you know, if they don't, they, they, these tank uh, communities responsible should just fill it up. So uh, there were 462 tanks in central China. So they've all gone Not, or most of them have gone. And I think, you know, the moment we, we forgot that, hey, you need these tanks because with such seasonal water, you need a place to store it. Instead, what I show in the book is they became very, very valuable as dry land and you know tanks are kept whole and this is the research from our institute that shows once the community around the tank really cherishes the tank the tank is protected and that's true even today even in Madurai a small tank but with a community like says the younger the we will protect it it's ours we will protect it it remains healthy but the moment the community like goes away the tank becomes vulnerable and it's the easiest thing to cover it up with some mud and make it fresh land. You see that pattern repeat time and time again, city after city in India. So that's problem number one. Problem number two, because we haven't valued our water, right? The treating our sewage doesn't make sense to us. You know, in the book, I call sewage the Brahmastra in our back pocket. Because I said there are four pro facets of India's water which make it problematic. Geographic variability, seasonality, you know, it varies across years. Sewage is reassuringly predictable. It's right there. It's right next to you. There's no geographic variability. It's there every day, right? And so people like, you know, countries like Singapore and Israel have tapped into that. And whereas we've forgotten. So, you know, that's the second point in urbanization. The third point is because we don't value it, we don't measure it. Why measure, spend all that money measuring what you don't value? So those are the three things. So we are trying to manage this black hole of a demand. And of course, you can't manage a black hole. Right. Yeah. You know, you made the point about Chanakya's system and uh, why as a society, we've always uh, put a value on water. I'm assuming, you know, this is not just monetary. Can you elaborate a little bit more on why it is important for us to remember this? Why, why are we saying that there shouldn't be a price? We've in India, you know, this fallacy, this very, very deep. And, you know, Rajendra Ji, Rajendra Singh and I were talking, you know, like, it's such a deeply held emotional belief today that water should be free. It has never been free in India. People have always paid for it through a share of labor or a share of crops. It's had a price. It's had a progressive price, but it's had a price. The rich pay more. Today, it's completely ulta, right? It's the wealthier people have access to bore wells where it's essentially free. Whereas the poor sort of 
pay for tanker water at exorbitant prices. And again, going back to our study, 2,000 households, that's that's a very significant number. And, you know, I think 40% buy water. And the lower you go on the socioeconomic ladder, the kind of privations, the loss of dignity is tragic. I mean, we spoke to one woman and she was not alone, who said, look, I don't have enough money. I have to buy water, but I don't have enough money for everyone in the house. So, you know, I have enough money for my newborn child, for my six-month-old to take care of its hygiene. But I don't have enough money to buy water for my two-year-old. So the two-year-old has to fend with her fledgling immune system with whatever is there in the dirtier water that's available. You know, those are the kind of trade-offs that are there. So I think free water is really fake news. It's not free. The poor really pay a very high price in time, in dignity, in health. So I think, you know, this opposition to a formal price. And again, you know, when you look at comparisons with other developing countries, let's forget Israel, let's forget Singapore. If we look at Colombo, if we look at, you know, places in sub-Saharan Africa, the people there, citizens there, as a share of their monthly income, pay far more for piped water than Indians do. I think there's a lot of people who can afford to... How much was your water bill? And by extension, how much water did you use today? I mean, I would I would challenge listeners to ask those two questions to understand if you're paying a meaningful price for water, right? Why would you manage? I mean, I spent my life in management, right? Why would you manage something that is not valuable? or is not seen as being valuable. And without management, we don't have a hope of hell of solving this crisis. Hope in hell of solving this crisis. Right. That's a grim story, right? In fact, I'm I'm just going to say that um, we probably spend more money um, eating out or or, or drinking in a month than we pay for for water, right? If you come to think of it. No, Um, no, no, no. Hang on. There is an analogy given there. I think there's two servings of pav bhaji. Is what a monthly water bill in Bombay costs. So wow. it's it's ridiculous. I mean, uh, those of us and m- many of us can afford to pay more than that. So I mean, there are two things I want to say on this pricing thing. One, we've always ha- has historically always had a price. It's been a seasonal, you know, geographically variable price in keeping with India's water. Progressive. So the people who use more pay more. And uh, secondly, the poor are paying a price today. Okay, and that's that's just not our study. It's study after study that's showing that. And compared to other developing countries in the world, we Indians pay a far too low a price of water. And you don't manage what you don't value. That's a grim story, right? And you know, I was li- I was listening to one of your recent interviews, um, and you had said something else which I found uh, very deep, which is climate change talks to us in the language of water, right? Um, and, and everything that we speak about eventually will, will hit us probably water first, right? Um, and, you know, having spent the amount of time you've spent in this uh, area, what gives you hope today, Mrithana? Is there anything that gives you hope? Yeah, there's a lot of things that give me hope. So, you know, nearly half the book is all focused on solutions, right? So it's a grim story, but it's not a hopeless story, right? And it's a personal experience. I knew nothing about any of this. I was as blind to the, you know, uh, water. It was invisible to me in my house until it ran out, right? So it's a a home story. And uh, we've reversed it, right? Uh, We don't buy water anymore. And we reversed it by watching, trying to understand it. Then we put meters to measure where we were using it, how we were using it, why we were using it. And only then we acted. And, uh, you know, the acting part, once you act with understanding, is uh, is not very expensive. And that's the message I want to share. I mean, and in the book, there is step by step on what we did. And some of those uh, people have told me are very helpful for them. And then there is a large section on technology of water, right? On what are the technologies that work, you know, from cloud seeding to water condensers, air to water condensers, which take, you know, humidity in the air and condense it into water, to drip irrigation, to dams, to, you know, you name it, it's there in the book. So it goes through the gamut and says, what can help you and why? But I think there are three things 
uh that uh, really like before i get to that i think any solution has to begin with the understanding what makes india's water unique what makes your water unique right if you're sitting in chennai if you're sitting in bangalore what where do you get your water from and how does that behave i think that understanding spending a little of a ta- little bit of time making your own balance sheet goes a long way but i think if there are you know that's at the individual level but if not everybody can solve their own problems but if i would to sort of step back and say what would really really help india solve its water problem i think there are three forests tanks which is these distributed storage thing and sewage so the the ironical thing karthik is that you know we have policies on all of these right bangalore has a fantastic policy on sewage probably the best in india one of the best in the world but it still has a flaming lake that you know periodically bursts into flame because of untreated sewage flowing into it so you know why doesn't it work uniformly and i go into that in the book but i think again it comes back to link between the solution and the community so in forests what are the things that can keep forests secure by improving cash flow to local communities so i go through things like you know how can you make tourism more valuable to local communities you know what are the few things you can do with case studies with stories on you know what works and what doesn't in tanks you know that's where our research has been you know we found that in earlier days so many benefits that tanks gave local communities from status to a uh, pride to spiritual brownie points to cash today a lot of those are gone right you know if it's a stinky lake filled with sewage and garbage what status can it give you why do you want to live next to it would anyone grow fish there would anyone want to eat the fish grown there i mean it's all these questions but how can we tip it into a good balance and there is a case study in madurai you know the teppakulam where in uh, you know when the courts got involved you know inspired this by this is the spirit. temple tank uh... yeah the mariamman teppakulam is a is a 8 hectare tank and you know uh, with court and government action and you know the uh, sparked off by a, a newspaper article encroachments were removed and water flowed in after 40 years and once that happened you know from almost no jobs it went to 43 jobs and our institute has put up like stuff you know you need, people can do to spur tank tourism and after doing some of those things we found that the number of jobs created by this one tank had grown to over 100 so you know you get the water security because once you have a functional tank it recharges groundwater our studies with you know almost 100 tanks found that groundwater levels go up by 200 feet once you have a functional tank with water in place right and that's a lot 200 feet of you know that's the 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 philip it gives you groundwater and you can do that by making sure these you reimagine these tanks as job engines rather than just think of them as water primarily because our water is not charged so you know there's a whole bunch of things you can do and uh, you know why does bangalore with a wonderful sewage policy have this flaming lake that unfortunately goes back to the price of water right because the there are studies there uh, there are two studies have quoted in the book that show that you know once communities are paying for tanker water basically they're living in day zero they love their sewage they just adore it they do everything they can to treat and reuse it right but if you're getting free ground water why treat your so- storage you're just ticking a mark that gets you past the regulatory hurdle and just moving on and i've gone into that in more detail but um, so i think a lot of people say you know this is the government's job right and i think true true but with everything there is a nuance and a caveat right so again in our institute we went out and asked about 900 people saying would you waste on water we actually asked waste and water because that's what we study and most people said no so imagine the scenario right if there is a small but significant group that says look i will vote for you only if you buy a water hungry crop from me and pay me a subsidy for it right in a dry place and the rest of us say i really don't care what you do then should you or would you blame political leaders for soft peddling this issue right and i think that's a question we need to ask because we've forgotten our water we've forgotten how volatile it is and i think climate change is making it it's just 
increasing its volatility i think the analogy i use repeatedly is if you take a photo on your smartphone and you put the contrast button all the way to the extreme that's exactly what climate change is doing to our water take a photo and it's just increasing the contrast making dry regions dry or wet regions better and at the time when we need resilience more than ever are uh, we are largely indifferent to water you know so how do you you know i got asked this question saying uh it should be policy i'm like yeah sure if everybody you know got it and we uh we voted on it we'll get sensible policy which is implemented evenly but when most of us are indifferent what you will get is reflecting that indifference so while policy can be very powerful given this relative uh, political powerlessness of water uh i won't hold my breath you know i, I want to end the episode um uh... With, with one positive action point, right? Uh, of, of all the things you mentioned, I for one really loved uh, what you said about understanding your own balance sheet of water, right? Um, if you were to leave the audience with one thing to remember and act upon, um, what would it be? Ask yourself two questions: When, how much water did you use today? That's it. And where did it come from, right? I think if you start with that and make a cons- and this can be anybody right it can be a person it can be a factory it can be a school it can be a city it can be a state it can be a country just two questions how much water did i use today and where did it come from and you know if you have to since the sewage is the brahmastra in our back pocket where is it going right and i think believe and this i'm talking you know with confidence because that's those are the questions we asked and we are water secure and that's not just one house in the factory we ask those questions again and we are secure right at the every individual who has found water security who have shown in the book they're all indians i mean there are cities there are villages who've achieved water security with that in india there is you know we talk of this political untouchability of uh pricing water right nobody wants to touch that hot potato but uh, there is a village in maharashtra which has 24 by 7 water where everybody pays they pay a progressive price people even paid for the inf- water infrastructure i mean they paid a share the villagers paid their share in the villages they're not very wealthy and it's happening in india and the story is there so i think just two questions uh three but two uh, you know how much water have you used today where is it come from and where is it going and i assure you if you ask and answer those questions and act on it you will find a greater water security in your life wonderful and a fabulous place for us to end this but uh, thank you so much for putting this in such an amazing perspective for us and good luck with all the wonderful work you're doing in this space no no thank you so much karthik Hey everybody, it's been another great week on the IVM Podcast Network. On Advertising is Dead, Varun talks to Hitesh Dhingra, founder of The Man Company. They take a look at how the male grooming industry has evolved. On The Longest Constitution, Priya explores the states of women's rights with respect to their bodies, contraception, and abortion. On Audio Gyan, Kedar meets user researcher Dharmesh Pa. They talk about the significance that research and insight bring to an organization. On the Musafir stories it's all about Hyderabad. Saif and Faiza talk to Yunus Lasania, curator of the Hyderabad History Project and the Beyond Charminar podcast. And on IVM Live, Santrikshan Zalak are joined by the hosts of Big Talk about Tiny Humans, Devi Shobha and Dr. Meghna. They raid Bollywood parent characters in a fun game. Do follow us on social media. We're IVM Podcast on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And remember, if you're enjoying this show or any of our other shows for that matter, please do tell a friend. The word of mouth really helps. Also, don't forget to rate us on whatever platform you're listening to us, and check us out on YouTube. You can check a list of all of our channels at ivmpodcast.com/slash/youtube. And finally, we'd like to thank our sponsors this week: Bank of Baroda and HDFC Life Insurance. Thank you so much for making this possible. Are you looking for finance products and services that can enhance your personal finance experience? Are you looking for a space to talk about your financial product or service? And are you looking for a crisp talk show where the conversation is all about money? Well, your search ends here. Hi, my name is Anupam Gupta and I'm host of the Paisa Paisa podcast and I invite you for the conversation about your personal finance on each Monday. 
on the IVM Podcast app or the website or on any podcast streaming platforms. See you folks.